Tiffany, dare I say, this is one of those times when you wish that Nathan was older and could read. <laughs> so he could read scripture. This morning's first scripture reading from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew. From the ninth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verses 9 through 13. And that can be found on page 941, if you're using a Red Church Bible. Again, the ninth chapter of Matthew, verses 9 Excuse me, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. May the Lord add his blessing. What a great passage of scripture. This morning's second scripture reading continues in the book of 2 Samuel. I'll be reading from 2 Samuel, the 18th chapter. And that starts on page 311 in the Red Church Bible. Again, the 18th chapter of 2 Samuel. David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. David sent out his troops, a third under the command of Joab, a third under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zeruah, and a third under Itai, the, the Gittite. The king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, you must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. Even if half of us die, they won't care. But you are worth 10,000 of us. It would be better now for you to give us support from the city. The king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. So the king stood beside the gate while all his men marched out in units of hundreds and of thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Itai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. Their David troops were routed by their Israel's troops were routed by David's men. And the casualties that day were great. Twenty thousand men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under a thick branch, of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept on going. When one of the men saw what happened, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Joab said to the man who had told him this, what, you saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have to give you 10 shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, even if a thousand shekels were weighted out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Etai, protect the young man, Absalom, for my sake. And if I had put my life in jeopardy and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have kept your distance from me. Job said, 
I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And 10 of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet and the troops stopped pursuing Israel for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him into a big pit in the forest and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the King's Valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's Monument to this day. Now Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, said, Let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by de- the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hand of his enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to a Cushite, go, tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Ahimez, son of Zadok, again said to Joab, come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, my son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you a reward. He said, come what may, I want to run. So Joab said, run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the wall roof of the gateway by the wall. As he stood out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he's alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another runner and he called down to the gatekeeper, look, another man running alone. The king said, he too must be bringing good news. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one run like, runs like Ahimaaz, son of Zadok. He is a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. Then Ahimaaz called out to the king, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my lord the king. The king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Job was about to send the king's servant and me your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, my lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. O Absalom, my son, my son. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks, Dave. Uh, What a heartfelt and moving passage. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, open the eyes of our heart 
uh, speak to our hearts. May your spirit prevail uh, during this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, this morning I want to talk to you uh, about showing mercy. And I was led to uh, choose a text and a passage that is uh, very long and somewhat complex and it has kind of competing themes. Uh, now, what I'll try to do is I'll try to attempt to sort, um, sort it all out. But what we need to do is we need to put some building blocks in place uh, to understand the narrative. Uh, we need to put some, some pieces into place because we want to understand how we get to chapter 18, all right? Now, how do we get to this point? So, if you recall, David sinned with Bathsheba, committed adultery, killed her husband. And God brought judgment upon David's household. And trouble comes to his reign in that way. Now, uh, i re reminded that Jesus said, each day has enough trouble of its own. And obviously he was talking about in the context of food, clothing, and shelter, right? But uh, isn't that especially true when sin comes to our household or sin comes our way? There's enough trouble with that, right? Add to it being king in Israel with enemies on all sides, there's great trouble. Uh, we see that with our current president, Donald Trump. Enemies on all sides, great trouble. Now, this is really important. Uh, it, 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 we need to understand that God could have removed King David from office, but he dealt with him showing great, great mercy. Now, you also probably know that the death penalty uh, was for adultery and for murder. That was according to the law. God didn't even execute that on David. That was, David, uh, that was God's prerogative. You also know that God had made a covenant with David that was eternal. That a seed would, uh, from David's loins would sit on the throne of Israel forever. And it has its ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you also know too that he will literally come back and rule and reign from Jerusalem. So, uh, as we talk about the family trouble that came to David's family, uh, it started with Amnon, David's oldest son. And I don't know if you remember the story, but Amnon lusted for his half-sister, Tamar. And so, Amnon, Amnon violated her rather than asking for her hand in marriage. Now, another part of the story, Tamar, who was violated, and Absalom, David's son, were brother and sister. There was nothing half about it. They were brother and sister of the same mother. And so what happened was, Absalom plotted in his heart to seek revenge, and he did it three years later, where Amnon was killed in cold blood. So a Absalom flees Absalom flees the kingdom and he goes to live with his mother's relatives outside the kingdom. Now, if you're a parent, can you imagine being distraught over the loss of a son and now you're also distraught over a son who has killed that son? and who is no longer in your presence. Now, here's another part of the story. Absalom also seems to be a favorite son of David. And if you go back to chapter 14, he's handsome, he's charismatic. Uh, there is, the scripture says there is no physical defect in him from head to toe. But not so much with the defects of his heart. Now. The other thing I want to do here is I want to bring in Joab, because Joab's a, a, a key part to the story. Not only is Joab the commander of the army, a lot of people don't know this, but he was David's nephew. He was the son of David's sister Zeruiah. Zeruiah. He's the first cousin. He's the first cousin to Absalom. <laughs> okay? Getting complicated, right? 
And so what happens is Joab sees that the king is mourning for Absalom's absence. And so what he does is he kind of orchestrates this scenario where this woman goes and kind of concocts this story before David. And David perceives that Joab's behind it. And so David relents. He lets Joab go and get Absalom from self-exile, bring him back into the, into the kingdom. But David consigns Absalom for two years to his own house. He's, he's in physical exile now within the kingdom. David doesn't want to see him because he hasn't dealt with it ultimately in his heart of hearts. And this is really, really important because full reconciliation really never took place. After two years, David brings Absalom into his presence. David forgives Absalom, but Absalom never got to that full reconciliation in his heart for his father and all that happened. And so after a while, the scripture says he sits at the city gate and he starts to turn the hearts of people in Israel against David. And so after a while, he leads a rebellion. That's how we get here, okay? And in, and in leading up to 2 Samuel 18, as we look at 2 Sam, Samuel, there's a lot of moving parts. But 2 Samuel 18 is about the death of Absalom at the hands of Joab. He killed his cousin. Now, before I give you a quick commentary on the chapter and get to what God has laid upon my heart this morning, I, I want to comment on the person of Job. I'm sorry, not Job, Joab. All right? Big difference between Job and Joab. Uh, it's not only just an, the letter A. Okay, So Joab gets mixed reviews, but this guy is not a good guy. He's a great military leader and a great general, and he did much to solidify David's rule and reign and to unite the kingdom. And generally, Joab is seen to be loyal to David. But, you know, you take that onion of loyalty, right, and you start to peel it back a little bit, and we start to see a very jealous and unscrupulous military commander. He's not a good guy. Joab is not a good guy. You do not want him as a cousin. Amen? And so it's fair to say that while he had David's back publicly and professionally, Scripture seems to indicate he was also undermining David very, very often and strengthening his own position. I'll give you a little example of that. When Joab started out as general of the army, he had one armor bearer, and yet the Scripture presents it now that he has ten armor bearers. Joab is really carving out a nice position for himself. Now, it seems that his honor was more about the position than it was about morality. I'll give you an example. He murdered Abner, the general who was under King Saul's army. Or he was the general of, of, of the army under King Saul. And so Abner, after the house of Saul dies and is displaced, Abner comes over and says, I want to serve David. And David brings him into the army. Well, if you go back into 1 Samuel, when they were fighting, when the house of Saul and the house of David were fighting, Azahel, Joab's brother, is chasing Abner. And Abner says, and this is wartime, Abner says, Azahel, don't, don't come near me. I'm going to have to kill you. And I don't want to look at your brother's face when I have, if I have to do that. Azahel would not listen. And Abner killed him during wartime. But Joab, when our Abner comes over into the kingdom, Joab doesn't like that. And so Joab kills Abner unsuspectingly in peacetime. The other thing is, Ab uh, Joab also murdered his other first cousin, Amasa. Now, you won't see that until if you, unless you read 2 Samuel 20. Amasa was the son 
of Abigail, who was also David's sister. So you have Absalom, Amasa as cousins, Absalom as cousins, and Joab as a nephew. Joab was a cousin, right? And so Amasa was put to the position of the uh, ge general in the army, and Joab was demoted. That's what chapter 20 indicates. Joab didn't like that, so he killed Amasa. And, and so it's fair to say that when you take a look at Joab, he's a brutal person. And he was a thorn in David's side for a very, very long time. After he killed Abner, David said, These sons of Zariah, his sister, are too hard for me. In other words, I can't, I can't handle them. They're brutal, right? Solomon eventually comes to power. David's ready to die. You know what he says to Solomon? Get rid of Joab. He shed innocent blood. He also tried to undermine Solomon coming to the throne. This, this, this was not a good guy, right? So Joab, fittingly, dies holding on to the horns of the altar, seeking mercy. He would not let go of the horns of the altar. So Benaiah, one of David's mighty men, slew him right there and desecrated the altar. That gives you a sense of how brutal Joab was and how undermining and how he was not a good person. And so he died in a very fitting way. He never showed mercy. Now, let's very, very quickly... I know I'm putting a lot of building blocks in place, but isn't it refreshing to recount the scripture like this? 2 Samuel opens, 2 Samuel 18 opens with David, David King David at Mahain, if I can say this, Mahain, Mahayim, a town east of the Jordan River. He's east of the Jordan because Absalom moved into the palace. Absalom is reigning from Jerusalem. David fled for his life to get out of Dodge, right? Now, the division here is much more than just two militaries fighting each other, two armies. It's a civil war. Absalom pulled the hearts of the people away from David, and they took sides. So you not only have army squaring off, but you have civilians enlisting into that army. It's a civil war, right? And so what David does, he, he, the battle tactics are such that he splits up his group into three groups. Joab leads one of them. And uh, the scripture says he was encouraged to not go out to battle because if you captured the king, the battle was over. No one else wanted to fight, right? So this is what he says. He agrees publicly, he, he, he agrees not to go out, but he publicly says before all the troops, all the commanders, and all the people, he says, be gentle with Absalom, verse 5, take care of him and protect him, verse 11. Show mercy to him, right? So what David does is he acts very quickly. Nearby was a forest, and he uses the forest to his own advantage because he was outnumbered uh, militarily. And so the strategy works. If you take a look at verse 8, the scripture says the forest devoured more than had gotten killed. Uh, that should be interpreted as they got confused and they got lost in the forest. Uh, and I, I looked at that and I think, praise God, less people died that day because they got lost and they were confused. Right? God's hand of mercy. Right? So... Divine providence has it that Absalom gets hung up in the tree. He's hanging from the tree. Now you know, I think you know, Absalom had a lot of hair on his head. And the scripture says that he would only cut it one time a year. So I did some research on this. And uh, when he cut his hair, uh, it's anywhere from three to five pounds. Probably more closer to three. But he, but he had a lot of hair. And 
He never shaved all of his head. He probably left a lot on his head, right? So, uh, probably got rid of it because it would start to pull his neck back a little bit, I would suppose. So, so he's hanging from the tree. And some of David's troops see him hanging from the tree. Now, I don't want you to miss this point. Okay? Providentially, he's hanging from the tree. And it's basically a curse to hang from a tree. That's what scripture says. A hanging or execution, as one scholar says, on a tree was the penalty for a crime worthy of death. So, I, I, the, folks, the picture here is that Absalom is a cursed man. He's a rebellious son under the law, should have been put to death. He's raised up his hand against the king, that should be, that's punishable of death. He leads an insurrection, which is a capital crime, that's punishable by death. And then if you go back a couple of chapters earlier, when he moved into Jerusalem, David had left ten of his concubines there, which were secondary wives, and Absalom sleeps with them and lets all of Israel see. That was punishable by death. So we have four capital crimes here punishable by death, right? And by doing that, Absalom says, I'm king, I'm in charge. Right? And yet, with all this, David wants to show great, great mercy. Now, I want you to capture um, the picture here. Absalom is a son, a rebellious son who's out of control. It's, he's punished, his acts are punishable by death. And hanging from a tree, I love, a scholar said providentially means the Lord has his ways of upholding his, his law. Isn't that true, huh? So Absalom's uh, actions are cursed. He hangs between heaven and earth. And he's not in a good place on the battlefield. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Providentially, could not God have allowed Absalom to have broken his neck in the tree? I think so. But this was also a divine occasion for others to follow the command of God's anointed. What did David say to the commanders and the troops and the people? Be gentle. Take care. Protect. The king's son was to be spared. Now, here's the other component to this that we don't often consider, but David as king is over the administrative branch of government, and he had the right to execute decisions in this regard. He could have said, kill Absalom or not kill Absalom. He's the Lord's anointed. And he knew nothing of the circumstances of Absalom hanging from a tree. Now, we can only assume that he found out later because he demoted Joab. He knew what ultimately happened. As the scripture says and as the soldier says, nothing is hid from the king. So, we have a king's command. Absalom is to show, be shown mercy. David's between a rock and a hard place. Uh, this is not someone else's son. This is his son. This is family. But this is also an issue of right or wrong. And so what do you do? Uh, and this is also coming from somebody who's received divine mercy. God showed great mercy when David committed adultery. God showed great mercy when he killed Uriah the Hittite. God showed great mercy time and time and time again in David's life. As a father... Shows compassion on his son, so the Lord does to those who fear him. And David extends such mercy to Absalom. That's what he does. He's received mercy from God Almighty, and he's showing mercy to Absalom, his son. And so this is what I see here, folks. There's this great tension between executing the law and showing great mercy. Now, if you look at Absalom... For Absalom, the battle's over. He's between heaven and earth. He can't wield the sword. He's probably kind of hanging from the tree with both arms. He's unarmed, defenseless, and vulnerable. 
Ever been, have you ever been in that place? Unarmed, defenseless, vulnerable? Yes. Yes, too often. And so what does Joab do? He, def he defies the king's charge regarding his son. And furthermore, if you read the account, he attempts to bribe the soldier to go do the dirty work himself. And what does the guy say? Not only did he not trust Joab, he's like, no, nah, you couldn't pay me enough to do that because it's going to be off with my head, right? Joab wants the soldier to kill, and the soldier, I'm going to have no part of this. Nada, none. So Joab takes the matter into his own hands, and he acts like king. He becomes judge, jury, executioner. He has no right to do so. He has no right to kill Absalom, and he has no right to tell the ten men around him to hack him up. That's a brutal person. He has no right, and yet he takes all that upon himself. Now, some would say that, well, it was wartime, and Job was just following the law. Interesting, he didn't follow the law when he killed his cousins now, did he? Or Abner. Uh, he did what was politically necessary, some would say. Uh, he did what David could not bring himself to do. Uh, he did what was best for the country. Um, uh, Absalom would have just caused more trouble and unrest in the kingdom, and we had to get rid of him. And, and while some of those things may be true, there's only one problem with this perspective. If you read chapter 18, great stress is laid upon the fact that Joab defied the king's command. That's what is put forth here. That's why Absalom dies. And if you so start to think about it, he's dismissive of David's word. He was dishonorably, publicly dishonorable to the king. And he brought a reproach upon David and his family. To top it all off, consider how he buries Absalom. It's in a very contemptible sort of way. He throws him in a ditch. He doesn't bury him in the family tomb. He buries him on the east side of Jordan, not in Jerusalem. He throws a heap of stones upon him, which is symbolic of Achan. Remember Achan? He was stoned to death and they covered him with stones. Judges chapter 8, a Cushite king was stoned to death and they covered him with stones. This is not a good picture, right? And so everything he did to Absalom was an affront to the house of David. As one scholar said, the value of that act, he was buried east of the Jordan, which meant he was excluded from the promised land. Now, if you're king, if you're David, what do you say about that? Now, we have a cold heart and a merciless heart in Joab. We have a general making these decisions. We have the nephew of the king making these decisions with no authority to do so. That's, that's the trouble that ultimately came upon David's household because of David's sin and a lot of other people's sin. Now, I don't know how long I've been speaking. That's a lot of summary of Scripture. But I want, to, I want to tell you what I see here. I see a king longing for his son. I see a king wanting to show love and mercy to his son. It's the very thing that God Almighty did to David. And I see this as a picture of God's heart for his children. Amen? David's heart is a picture of God's heart for his children. I also see a rebel son, a family member, cursed and hanging from a tree. 
and I see me in Absalom, and I see you in Absalom, and everyone else is in Absalom, cursed and hanging from a tree, rebellious. And yet you have the heart of God, the heart of David for his children. I also see a bunch of self-righteous hackers and whackers who will run anybody through. They don't desire mercy, they desire sacrifice. They will find any legal and righteous justification for whatever they do. They'll use scripture to even do it. And it doesn't matter if you're the king's son or the peasant's son. They'll run you through. They'll hack and whack you. This past week, you probably know that Liberty University and uh, the Falwells were in the news. Uh, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s wife apparently had an affair uh, for a number of years. Uh, very, very tragic. And it ended a number of years ago, several years ago. And if you read the article, the ex-lover was seeking to extort money from them or expose the affair and hurt them and hurt the school. So Falwell said nothing about it for several years because he wanted to protect his wife and his family and the university, and rightly so. It's an honorable thing for someone to protect your spouse like that. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins, right? But they decided that the stress of sharing openly was less than the stress of sharing, uh, of living, I'm sorry, living with the extortion being held over their heads. So they went to the board. The board put Jerry Falwell Jr. for a, a couple of weeks of leave of absence. And this past week he resigned. Uh, you can imagine the fallout. It's huge. I mean, that's a... Huge university, the Falwell name in Christian community circles is absolutely huge, right? I, I mention all this because I see a lot of similarities being the, between the text and situations in the Christian community. God tells us in Scripture that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. John chapter 8, you know the story the woman's caught in adultery and they bring her to Jesus. And what does he do? He shows mercy. And he says, he who has no sin casts the first stone. And yet, what is the first thing that happens in the Christian community? We throw stones. So we do. Like Joab's attendants and Joab, we hack and we whack. That's what we do. And that's not what should be done. I say we, referring generally to the church and the Christian community. You may not have a part of it. Amen. Now, I bring this up because it's public news. And I want to make a point here, obviously. Now, our church has no affiliation with liberty. I have no personal affiliation with liberty. Uh, I hear it's a really good school. I hear they have a pretty strict code of conduct for their students. I went to a Bible school like that. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of the student code, and it, that's not really the point. The point here is what a great opportunity for the Christian community to show the heart of God, to show the heart of David for one of its own. And of course, they were getting a lot of fallout and hacking and whacking. You know, the Christian community needs to embrace the Falwells like never before. Not kick them to the curb. If you embrace them, it doesn't mean you condone what happened. You embrace them to help them move along from what happened. It's, it's showing the love and mercy of Christ. The, the sinful situation, the affair is not ongoing. It's done. Move on. It's been addressed within the family. You know, I read an article about, a follow-up article about that 
last week? I was praying that God would have people on that school board, some very godly people, that would be like David and want to show mercy. That they wouldn't be interested in sacrifice. That they would want to obey the king's command. That they wouldn't want to really hack and whack. You know, and I take a look at that. Uh, these people need other people to love them, to embrace them, to show the heart of Christ. To be that forgiving father, like in the parable of the prodigal. To be that compassionate person in the parable of the Good Samaritan. To go after the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. To be like a David rather than a Joab. The university needs people that are like cedar trees, tall and strong and don't waver in the wind. You know, culturally, what does the culture want you to do? Hack and whack them. We see that in corporate America. Hack and whack. Kick them to the side. Shame culture. Right? I can't imagine being a board member in that situation. Culturally, people want you to hack and whack and you go this way. Financially, they want you to hack and whack because you're going to lose a lot of money. You see? They need to be straight as an arrow morally. They need to carry their wounded and their slain off the battlefield. That's what they need to do. And yet, sadly, some are going to come in like Job and the attendants. Some will also come in like David, I pray. Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom. Or in this case, uh, Jerry and Becky Falwell. Oh, Jerry and Becky Falwell. You know, uh, our military has a great policy. Leave no person behind. Amen? Doesn't matter if you're wounded or if you're bodily dead. They go in and they get you. Oh, that our churches and believers would adopt such a policy. No, no, we, don't, we just leave them. Like, like the Levite and the priest, we walk around and lead them bleed out. You know, if the world saw our churches like the Good Samaritan taking their own off the battlefield and caring for them, maybe our churches would be fuller. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, uh, only the sick need a physician. I see the church like a spiritual hospital. It's the place to apply the ointment, the bandages, the place for mercy, forgiveness, healing, and well-being. Not for self-righteousness. Uh, Lord knows uh, one does not find uh, mercy and forgiveness and healing in the world. In closing, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want you to think about this. If we do not show mercy, we end up like Joab holding to the horns of the altar when we need it, and then we get hacked and whacked. It's the way it works, right? He was shown no mercy because he showed no mercy. It was very sad, very sad way to die. Uh, so let's sum this up here very quickly. Uh, obey the king's command and show mercy. God is judge, jury, executioner. Amen? Like the foot soldier who found Absalom, have no part in the hacking and the whacking. That's God's department. Amen? God's department. Be that person. Be that person that carries your brother or sister off the battlefield. Be that person to apply the 
ointment and the bandages and the band-aid and, and, and bind them up and bring healing. That's the heart of Christ. Not, not running the spears through. There's no value in that. No value. That's what God has laid upon my heart this day. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we all are hanging from a tree, uh, suspended like Absalom between heaven and earth, and we are in great, great need of your mercy. And we are in great, great need in our heart of hearts uh, to show mercy. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We, we thank you for the mercy that you've shown to David's household, and we thank you that has come to its fulfillment uh, uh, of a boat full of mercy to our hearts in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would take that uh, boatload of, of mercy uh, from these walls and that we would share it with people, uh, share the heart of God, share the heart of the King uh, for his children, for Adam's race. Uh, we thank you for this scripture. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.